So in the previous video we already talked about how it's a little bit more difficult to uh, consider Hermitian operators um, simply as an extension from finite dimensional Hilbert spaces into infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So um, let's look at this Hermitian operator where A um, is equal to A adjoint. And so really what we're talking about here is a self adjoint um, operator. So where um, the requirements or the domain of A and A adjoint are the same. So let's consider this eigenvalue equation. This is the same example as at the end of the previous video, but let's consider this eigenvalue equation on L2 over uh, one dimensional real numbers with our operator A equal to the momentum operator minus IH bar DDX. So if we write the uh, eigenvalue equation with an eigenvalue A, an eigenfunction phi, um, then we get this differential equation which has as a solution C times E to the IAX. So that's one Eigen, um, eigenvector or eigenfunction of this uh, eigenvalue equation. But if we look at phi, um, this is actually not part of L2 over R since uh, we have a divergent um, integral. So this is not a square integrable function, which was the requirement for L2. So um, you might say, well, we also looked at this operator P and we showed that it was unbounded, that we uh, can uh, have uh, P operating on phi such that uh, P phi is not uh, d diverges, so that uh, the norm of P phi diverges. So um, is that caused maybe by the fact that this operator is unbounded? Well, we can consider another operator which was bounded, the X operator. Uh, X is bounded on L2 over the interval between 0 and 1. And we'll write our uh, differential equation now as x times an op uh, eigenvalue chi, or eigenfunction chi, has to be equal to a times the um, eigenfunction chi. So a, again, acts here as the eigenvalue. Now we can see that this function, that this uh, equation, does not have any solutions in L2 uh, between 0 and 1, or over, z over the interval 0, 1. But um, we can introduce a construct which is not a function and certainly not a member of this uh, of this uh, L2 uh, over 0 to 1. And that construct is the delta function. So if we, um, if we consider chi sub a, the eigenfunction associated with the eigenvalue a, to be this delta function, then uh, this is of course correct. And uh, um, the, the eigenvalue equation holds. Then x times this delta function is a times the delta function. Because, of course, the delta function is only non-zero at a. OK, so um, Hermitian operators do not always have eigenvectors or eigenvalues, as, is, as was the case in the finite dimensional um, uh, Hilbert spaces. The operators that do have eigenvectors and eigenvalues are called compact operators. So those are um, operators for which we have solutions for this a phi equals to eigenvalue a phi, um, where we have solutions for that equation. And um, there's, of course, a, a stricter definition of compact that doesn't take the circular approach as, uh, as defining compact operators as the ones that have solutions of this eigenvalue equation, but that's outside of the scope here. Now, the question really is, what are eigenvalues? So uh, um, let's consider a finite dimensional case. Um, so we have our, our, our finite dimensional eigenvalue equation here. Um, if we just move the, the right-hand side to the left-hand side, really what this says is that A minus eigenvalue A times the identity operator, that operator A minus A times the identity operator operating on any state phi will be zero. So um, this operator A minus Z times the identity operator is a, in general an operator that depends on the value of Z. And that operator will have a domain D that depends on Z and an image of all of the um, elements in the domain that is image is uh, delta of, uh, of C. So that again depends on Z. So if we think about that as uh, uh, in a diagrammatic way, so everything here is inside this Hilbert space, um, and we have our uh, domain and our image, and A minus Z times the identity projects elements from the domain onto its image, and if there's an inverse, then the inverse takes elements from this image and projects them back onto the domain. And of course, D 
um, and delta could be equal to the Hilbert space itself. They could have uh, um, they could have a non-zero intersection. So this is really just a diagrammatic representation. Now let's look at uh, eigenvalues. So if we have an eigenvalue, then um, or let's first consider um, the case where the image is actually the entire Hilbert space. If the image for a particular value of z is the entire Hilbert space, then we call z a regular value of this operator a minus z times the identity. And in that case, that means that the inverse of a minus z times the identity exists, and there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between dz and delta z. Now the other case here that follows from our identity operator, uh, from our uh, um, uh, eigenvalue equation here, if that image for a particular value of z is is the null set, or the set that only includes the null element of the Hilbert space, then we call z a singular value of that operator a minus c times the identity operator. And in that case, um, the uh, everything gets projected onto zero, so it's an, an all to one correspondence, and there's of course no inverse, because the only thing you, we could do is, is, is start from this uh, this null um, element, and of course we can't get back to our uh, original phi from that. So eigenvalues are now um, those values for which um, a minus c times the identity has an image that is only um, the null element. And so there could be a set of discrete values, discrete eigenvalues, a1 through an, and possibly an, uh, a denumerable set, a countable set of eigenvalues. Or it could be a continuous spectrum. So for example, here, a set of numbers that starts at a, at a certain value and that continues on. And so we'll write those as a, um, as a function of nu. Um, it could even be um, a, a combination of discrete and continuous values. So if we think of uh, the eigenvalues for the energy in a, uh, a, an, a square potential well that is, uh, that is not infinitely large, so there will be continuous values of the energy possible um, above the height of the potential well, but below the height of the potential well, we'll end up with, uh, with quantized sets. So we'll have uh, discrete eigenvalues um, in the well and then uh, continuous spectrum above the, um, the level of the, the potential well. In fact, it's even possible, although you really have to um, construct as an operator specifically for that, it's even possible that some of these discrete eigenvalues fall inside the ranges of the continuous spectrum. So, uh, so that's, of course, going to be a tricky situation, which we hopefully won't encounter at all in this course. Now back to what we uh, had defined earlier. So we defined these uh, phi sub a and, and chi sub a um, eigenvectors, and I'm pointed out that they're actually not eigenvectors, since they're not part of the Hilbert space that we're looking in. So again, c times e to the i a x is not square integrable, and delta, the delta function of x minus a, um, is uh, is not even a function, right? It's uh, technically it's called a distribution. Um, so if we now introduce these these elements as pseudo eigenvectors, we can introduce a normalization, or in some sense, a pseudo normalization. Um, by making use of the delta function again. So if you have two eigenvectors or pseudo eigenvectors phi sub a and phi sub b, um, and we'll use as a normalization quantity c, uh, one over square root of, um, uh, of two pi, then we'll find that this uh, scalar product of phi a and phi b is e to the i b minus a times x. And if we, um, we consider this as a, uh, an integral, then we get, of course, our delta function of a minus b. So this is how our pseudo eigenvectors, phi a, are normalized using this pseudo um, normalization with uh, the delta function. We can do the same thing with, uh, with the eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvectors, pseudo eigenvectors for, um, for chi a or chi a and chi b. And so that integral is now the delta function of x minus a and x minus b. Um, and that, of course, will give us uh, the delta function of a minus b as well. So again, this will be normalized. Um, so these are pseudo eigenvectors with some kind of pseudo normalization, um, but we'll, of course, refer to them as eigenvectors um, that are normalized. But it's important to know um, what this exactly means and that those are not really eigenvectors, 
um, of, our, uh, uh, of our operators. So using this, we can, of course, write our spectral decomposition. So uh, if we have some discrete eigenvalues with discrete eigenfunctions or eigenstates n, so those will be normalized with our delta, uh, with our, our Kronecker delta, um, and then we'll have some set of continuous eigenvalues where we have our eigenvalues a um, depending on, uh, on nu, and those are normalized using our delta um, or Dirac delta function. Let's assume for the sake of argument here that there's no degeneracy. If there is degeneracy among the, the discrete eigenvalues, um, then of course we'll have to sum over that additional um, dimensionality of the, the eigenvector subspace corresponding with that um, eigenvalue. And we'll also assume, of course, that there's um, there's orthogonality between the discrete and the continuous eigenvalues. So it's not just that the discrete eigenvalues are orthogonal to each other, and the eigen and the continuous eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other, but they're also orthogonal um, uh, between discrete and continuous eigenvalues. Then we can write our uh, operator A in a spectral decomposition, which will have part of the discrete spectrum and a part given by the continuous spectrum. So the discrete spectrum will be our, um, our, our uh, cat for the eigenvector times the eigenvalue times the bra. And in the case of the continuous spectrum, it's the same thing really, except we're now taking the integral over nu um, since that is uh, uh, a continuous quantity now. And if we take a equal to one with eigenvalues equal to one, that immediately gives us our um, identity operator. So the identity will now be the sum over those projection operators on uh, on the discrete eigenvalues, and then the integral over the projection operator on the um, continuous eigenvalues. Okay, so this was our treatment of uh, Hermitian operators, and uh, now we'll move on to a treatment of unitary operators. So unitary operators, naturally, uh, they're unitary, so they satisfy u dagger u is equal to the identity, or that's equal to u times u dagger. Um, and so the inverse always exists and is equal to the um, to u dagger. This will always be a bounded operator. Why is this a bounded operator? Well, um, remember what we said about operators being bounded. That means that um, they, there's, there's no state phi such that um, the um, such that u operating on phi returns an element that is not bounded. And so here, if we take the supremum of uh, u phi of the the magnitude of u phi for a normalized phi, that will of course just give us one the normalization of phi because u doesn't change that normalization. And so we'll call this the norm of the operator. And so the norm of the operator u will be equal to one. Okay. Um, so we can actually write u as e to the i alpha times a, where a is a Hermitian um, operator. It's not a matrix necessarily. Um, that's only a specific representation. So this is an operator. So if we write u, um, which now depends on some parameter alpha, as e to the i alpha a, we can write this in terms of the spectral decomposition of our Hermitian operator a. And so we'll get our e to the i for the the discrete eigenvalues and e to the i, um, and then the continuous eigenvalues. If we look at this entire expression, of course, we'll see that um, e to the i alpha a sub n and e to the i alpha um, or e to the i alpha a um, nu that those are going to be the eigenvalues of u, um, and all of those will have a unit norm, so they'll be located on this unit circle. Um, so some of them might be discrete, some of them might be, um, might be continuous ranges. We can also see, based on the expression as uh, in, in terms of this Hermitian operator, that u alpha satisfy the, satisfies the, the property that u alpha 1 after u alpha 2 is equal to u of the sum of the parameters alpha 1 and alpha 2. And in addition, if we take the parameter alpha equal to zero, we find um, the identity operator here, just based on our uh, um, exponential expression there. So basically what that will mean um, is that the U, uh, these unitary operators depending on, uh, on alpha form a Lie group. 
And the inverse is also true. If we have a set of unitary operators that satisfy this, that u alpha after u alpha 2, u alpha 1 after u alpha 2 is equal to u, the sum of alpha 1 and alpha 2, and if u alpha u for alpha equal to 0 is equal to the identity, then there must exist a Hermitian operator t such that u um, of alpha is equal to e to the i alpha t. And that operator t is what we will call the generator of the group um, u alpha. So uh, um, in the case of, for example, uh, some common symmetry groups, SU2, um, or even in the case of, uh, um, of transformations in space and in time, we will find these generators uh, because of the fact that their Hermitian will find that they have some physical interpretation. Okay, that's all about, uh, about generators. So again, remember that there is um, some, uh, some careful mathematics involved in uh, interpreting eigenvectors in, continu or in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but we'll mainly overlook that and just uh, assume that we can call these delta functions and uh, non-normalizable functions um, that we can call those uh, also eigenvectors. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind though is that now a Hermitian operator is not guaranteed to have um, eigenvectors and uh, only a compact operator is. So that's it for this video.